Um, welcome everyone to Queer Theology. It's so lovely to see you all here tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, so first of all, we have Angela Shirt, who uh, previously uh, a junior doctor and currently ordained at Queen's College in Birmingham. Um, the Reverend Simon Woodman, uh, minister at Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church. Um, Reverend Dr. Christina Beardsley, healthcare chaplain, um, pastor, researcher, author, and trans-Christian activist, uh, advocate, uh, the Reverend Dr. John Russell, and the Associate Rector of St. James's in Piccadilly, and finally, um, Reverend Sally Hitchner, Associate Vicar of the Ministry of St. Martin's in the Fields. Um, so, we're gonna kick things off with thinking about queerness itself. Um, what, everyone, is your relationship to the word queer? Um, Angela, if we can start with you. Okay, well, I guess when I was reflecting on these questions, this one seemed like a place where, where my own story might be a way of getting into, into my relationship with the word queer. I guess in my journey with this word, I've had to critically examine an approach to doing theology that I took for granted. And I suppose the first thing that came to mind in my journey with the word queer is that I needed a community to, in order to make that journey. I don't think I could have journeyed into the word queer on my own. I guess my, my own story is that I used to be Roman Catholic and I fell in love with my best friend who identified as the same gender as me. And it was an experience that in many ways completely turned my world upside down. Maybe that, that's where my journey with the word queer began, I suppose. It turned my world upside down in quite a radical way. And I ended up seeing my university counselor who said, well, have you thought that there might be communities of LGBT Catholics out there? And that was perhaps another radical twist in the tale because that was a new horizon for me. I'd never thought that could be possible. I eventually found a young adult group of LGBT Catholics at Farm Street Church in Mayfair. And I joined that group. We met for mass fairly regularly but we also had discussion groups and workshops where we, I suppose, we tried to understand who we were as queer people. And I think, I think that really helped me. That really helped me to, to understand my experience in a way that affirmed my relationship with God. And so I suppose now I understand being queer as, in a strange way, being close to the heart of God. I think, I think over the years I have seen that, for me, God is queer, in the sense that God radically crosses boundaries and barriers that we place in society to divide people. If God is, in any sense, radical unity and love, then God transcends those boundaries. Um, and, and perhaps in some way I felt affirmed in crossing some of those boundaries myself. That's lovely, thank you. Simon. Um, Angela, thank you. My, I, I'm coming at this as an outsider to the term. Um, when I was at school, uh, the word queer, uh, along with the word gay, was used. Um, they were used synonymously and were used primarily as insults. Uh, I'm not sure most of us. I'm not entirely sure most of us even knew uh, what was meant by them when they were being used. Um, I was an all boys grammar school in the 1980s, uh, and um, most of us knew we were supposed to like girls, but most of us had no access to girls because we were at an all boys school. So uh, somebody like me who didn't like playing rugby and uh, did weird things like believing in God uh, was made a target for, uh, ironically given that I am straight, what would have been homophobic abuse had I actually not been straight, but it was just in that insulting world. Um, I am glad to say that I've journeyed a very long way from those teenage years. 
Um, and I think it was largely through Green Belt that I became aware through the safe space <coughs> that they were running that I don't get to write the script on what being human is by virtue of sitting in the dominant expression of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was kind of brought up to believe that I did. And I had to learn that actually the world is made so much more diverse than me. Uh, so for me, my relationship with queer has gone from it being an insult of teenage years at a fairly facile level to an understanding that I need to decenter myself within humanity and within my understanding of God to recognize that I have so much to learn about God from those who are not like me. Thank you. Christina, please, Philip. Well, we have a saying in Yorkshire, there's no the queerest folk, excepting thee and me, and that's a bit queer. And of course, that sort of normalised as queer, just a bit odd. It's not necessarily anything to do with sexuality or gender, but like Simon, I can remember the, the stigma and the shame as well that became attached um, to the word queer. Um, I think it's quite a useful word because, I mean, some people, conservatives tend to complain about the alphabet soup, but the thing is that our identities do shift. My, mine certainly has. I identified as gay at one time of my life and then later as trans. So a word like queer is quite good because it can bring us all together however we identify on that spectrum and it can include allies and people who are just a bit off centre. That I think is the origin of it from the game of cards, a queer card, something a, a card that was eccentric. You wouldn't expect somebody to play that. So this um, sense of being not at the centre, maybe on the margins, on the fringes, having a different outlook. And, and for me, it, it, it's Le Cage au Fort when Alban says, you know, here at Le Cage au Fort, we live life um, at, a, at another angle. And in his song, I Am What I Am, he, he says, um, why not try to see things from a different angle? And I think that's what uh, queer theory and queer theology and queer life tries to do. I really love that. Thank you, Christina. It's, it reminds me a lot of um, the Emily Dickinson line, tell, it, tell the truth but tell it slant, um, coming at things from different angles. John, please tell us what you think about the word queer. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a gay man in my late 40s, so I lived through the, the rise and fall of queer in the, in the 1990s, and that was um, immensely formative of my, my personal identity, my politics, my worldview. Um, I, as an English literature undergraduate, I got introduced to feminist theory at that immensely creative moment when it gave birth to lesbian and gay studies and then queer theory. Um, I graduated in the big summer of queer when Vanity Fair put Katie Lang on the cover being wet shaved by Cindy Crawford in a bikini where suddenly kind of everyone wanted to be queer. We had the, the best music, the best clubs, the best sex, but it was also the death knell of queer for something that was so tied to transgression to become so popular. Um, uh, I did the, um, the sexual distance and cultural change in at Sussex and I wrote about serial killers and sex workers and sadomasochism, all, all the queer classics at that time. Um, and then I did what a lot of queer academics did when I did my doctorate. I, I took the tools of queer theory and started to apply them in areas beyond sexuality um, and looked at the um, social construction of psychosis. Um, and a lot of people started to do that around that time. But by the time I'd finished that work, queer, was, queer had died, as, as far as I could see, as an academic subject. Um, so it's wonderful to be sitting here um, 20 years later where it seems like queer is having a, 
a bit of a resurrection and is a, is a topic again, both kind of academically and, and in popular culture. Great, thank you. And Sally, if any of um, you. Well, I, I just think what's been shared has been brilliant. I really I particularly like Tina's thought about queer being eccentric outside the centre and it makes me think of Bethlehem or Nazareth being where Jesus spent most of his time outside of the centre. Um, the thing that I was struck by in preparing for this was just that the idea of normal wasn't really a word until about 200 years ago, though, and that was primarily actually about disability and disfigurement, that pretty much everyone had something that had happened to them that made them look different from other people. And I think the idea of queer really, from my understanding, has come in with modernism and this idea of uniformity in factories, creating this possibility of the good being a type um, and I think, I, so I grew up in an evangelical house church. Um, I, was, I was the good girl. I went through the rank. I slightly pushed the boundaries getting ordained. And that, I had lost friends from that uh, as a woman being ordained. Um, but then right the way through from when I was really from about 12, I just knew that I was gay. And I just thought well, I hadn't met the right man yet. And so I went through and got ordained in a very evangelical theological college and went and did a curacy in a very evangelical curacy. And by the end of that, just thought, I cannot deny this anymore. I have to create space in my life to be different. Um, and uh, I think there was a real liberation in being different, perhaps being queer. I remember um, someone introduced me as... Uh, this is Sally, she's a godly woman. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? Um, and actually, that was only about a month or two before I came out. I was outed, I was outed on TV, don't do that. Um, but but uh, there was something that was really liberating about being outside of the expectations. That for, I, I slept maybe 14 hours a night for about two months because I was just, my brain was in shock trying to get my head around my new future. But there was also a feeling of flying. I remember dreaming a lot of flying and just this possibility of being something different and not having to be confined to anything. And the radicalness of being queer. I, I don't know if you've seen um, the film Pride, um, but they, there's this great scene where they take the insults and they put them on T-shirts and they own them. And I think that's really been something that has been done by the LGBT com community around the word queer. It's been moved from being an insult to being something that has, has something to offer. Um, and I think actually, I wonder what queer means now in our liberal churches, who are those who are queer to us um, and how can they be prophetic voices? I find those images of, of breaking out and, and imagining new spaces so helpful. And I wonder if we can think about that in terms of our faith. Um, do we think that Jesus is queer? What can we think? Um, Sally, if you'd like to start this time. Um, yes. I, I think there's really interesting understandings about um, gender and sexuality in the Bible. I mean, we were just briefly talking about this before we came in, that, that actually I don't think the Bible cares about who you fancy. The Bible just, in the Bible, biblical, old and new biblical times, I mean, the, the writers don't really factor that in. It's all about gender, and it's all gender means hierarchy. It doesn't even mean you know, anything in particular beyond that. I think there's something really interesting about Jesus' non-marriage, um, that he is stepping outside of that hierarchical engagement with a woman, um, or, and stepping outside of that expectation of producing heirs, and you know, all of those things, which would have been really radical. I mean, we're used to seeing single men walking around now and get, having friends who are just single men or celibate men. But in those days, that was rad, it was, it was, hugely radical to the point where I know that there's some people who wonder whether he was uh, intersex because the pressure to marry would have been so great that people wonder why is that not commented on um, and that maybe there was something that was just understood in his small community that he was one of the people who couldn't marry I mean, who knows and it definitely makes interesting theological thinking that Jesus you know was representative of women as well as men and, and all genders were there, so I, I don't know. Um, I think Jesus was chose queerness in the people who he hung out with. Um, he chose the people who were not at the centre um, and who were um, not considered to be the aspirational um, norm. Um, and I think there is an element of Christian identity which 
has to be queer and is always in translation when it's not. That's wonderful, thank you. John, please tell us about what you think. Um, I suppose for me, queer is a political, is a political project and, and I'd be a bit cautious about co-opting the son of God as a poster boy for any particular political project because I think God only has one project which is the reconciliation of everything um, but having said that I mean Jesus certainly ticks quite a few queer boxes he's a he's a political radical he's he's challenging the dominant culture he's he's doesn't seem concerned about mainstream acceptance um, he creates a an alliance of misfits who start um, setting up a um, prefigurative community um, there's a uh, there's a strong element of anti-shame there's a kind of there's an embracing of you know difference and stigmatization um, that goes as far as the cross um, uh, the I suppose for me the, the queerest thing is the it's the um, it's the undermining of binaries stuff it's all that it's all that topsy-turvy kingdom of God talk that to me seems very queer um, and ultimately what who do we think the cosmic Christ is and what you know if if that isn't something which um, destabilizes our tendency to create categories and then assign um, value to them sure, surely it's that you know the the risen and ascended Christ is is beyond the categories that we have the binaries that we have Wonderful. Christina, please tell us. I find the Bible itself quite a, a queer document. And in the Old Testament, um, it seems because um, Israel is surrounded by these superpowers. So actually, it's not the center of and you get that preference then throughout scripture for, it's like for the underdog really, but it's, it's always the junior member of the family, isn't it? it it's, it's, it's Jacob, not Esau, it's, it's Joseph, not Judah, it's David, not his brothers. And, and yet, but David's very interesting because he then comes to the, to the center. So you've got this play, I think, in scripture between the center and the margins um, all the time. And, and, it, and in the prophets, I suppose in Jesus, you've got this powerful prophetic critique of the center from the margins of somebody who is actually the center of um, the whole of God's, God's purposes. That's, quite, that's quite, a, quite a lot to take in. And Simon? Um, yeah, so if we think of Jesus as um, the one who reveals God, uh, I was really struck by Angela saying earlier that God is queer. And uh, I, I think as humans, we have a tendency to construct God in our own image rather than to recognize that we are made in the image of God. And therefore, the dominant expression of humanity ends up writing itself onto God and making that God. Uh, and I think. In, in the story of Jesus, the stories of Jesus' life, we, we find that being broken down um, in, in some quite radical ways, which is then having the knock-on effect of altering the way we understand who God is in relation to humanity. So I think Jesus um, transgenders himself on a number of occasions. Um, I, I think, you know, just, just a little phrase where Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem, longing to gather Jerusalem as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Um, I think if you look at um, the foot washing from John's Gospel, foot washing elsewhere in both Old and New Testament, that it's consistently done by, by women, and yet Jesus takes that on. People often cast that as being the servant's role. It was the woman's role, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jesus does it and becomes the woman at that point. Um, and I think you know we've observed that you know he's unmarried, he's childless, he defies gender and sexual norms of his day. He's known for associating with those. 
whose own sexual history or gender identity may be ambiguous. So I think in Jesus we've got a revelation of God as encompassing far more than what historically, and recently at least, um, Christians have tended to construct God as being. And I think there's a bit of an antidote to uh, heteronormative idolatry in, in the story of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Angela, what do you think? Well, I guess I think quite a lot of kind of ideas around Jesus challenging heteronormative ideals um, and, and in certain various ways embodying um, queerness in the sense of it being a radical political and social movement. A lot of that's already been said. But I, I was really struck by what Sally said about this kind of almost liberatory feeling of coming out and this, this almost sense of flying. And, and I wonder whether we could think about queerness as something that we yearn for. Queerness is something that we desire on, a, on quite a deep level. And I wonder if that might add a, a further dimension to Jesus as being queer. Jesus was somebody that people yearned for, somebody who awoke desires very deep inside people, desires for God, because, because Jesus is the embodiment of God. And, and I wonder whether, whether Jesus' queerness is, is a part of that, whether, it, whether queerness awaken something deep within us, this longing for boundaries and binaries which we construct around sexuality, gender, and other areas, ethnicity and disability and so on, whether Jesus somehow represents that longing that we have for those boundaries to be dissolved and for us to be reconciled, reconciled with difference, and whether there's a kind of foretaste of that in the queerness of Jesus. That's so wonderful. Thank you, Angela. So we've been thinking about the, um, the, the queerness of Jesus, of the Bible, of um, various Christian traditions, but what do we do with those traditions and those spaces and parts of scripture that do not feel like they're queer affirming, um, do not feel like they make space for um, a queer community? Um, John, if I can start with you. Um, well, I'm, I'm a liberal Catholic, so arguing over proof texts isn't, isn't really quite my gig really um, but I would um, I mean I my position would be is that um, scripture is a an inspired pathway for grace but I certainly don't believe that scripture is infallible I don't think it's being you know dictated to the authors by angels um, you know it's um, as Tina said you know the, the Bible is a queer book I mean it's it's 66 books um, there are something like 40, 40 to 100 authors, probably all men. Um, it's written over something like a thousand years. Um, it shows us a, um, a huge range of kind of different apprehensions of God and different ideas of, of what it is to live righteously. Um, amidst all that, we have um, a, a very small number of texts that can be interpreted in a um, in an anti-queer way, let's let's use that terminology. Um, but there isn't a there isn't a single one of them that hasn't given rise to a huge amount of academic debate about exactly what it means. I mean, what what is the sin of Sodom? Is it is it men having sex? Is it rape? Is it um, being inhospitable to strangers? You know, at this point, we just can't we can't tell, and there's there's arguments on all sides. Um, uh, I certainly don't think there's a there isn't a clear correspondence between those obscure references potentially to sexual practices and the the modern social identity of being um, lesbian, gay, trans anything else um, yeah but I don't know whether anyone wants to engage with proof text a bit more than I'm interested in doing and um, Sally, can I turn to you? Sure. Um, so, I don't know how I identify theologically now, but I definitely grew up evangelical, so it was really important for me to work all this thing out, and I spent probably far too many hours worrying, worrying about it. The biggest headlines I've come away with are that the Old Testament was really about the separateness of Israel, and if you look at any reference to sexuality or gender and prohibitions about it, there's all sorts of other things around it that clearly just seem to be about defining the specialness of Israel. Um, 
and uh, the importance of them being a distinct nation. Um, so even like sacrificing to foreign gods or sacrificing to Yahweh in front of foreign temples is considered as, it's very similar in the, its language as, um, as uh, gay male sex. And I think the other really interesting thing about the Old Testament is, I, I mean, this is really something I've got from my colleague Sam Wells. Um, it, it, he really believes that the Old Testament is there to show us the reality of humanity so there's very little ethics in the Old Testament. The examples, there's awful, awful lot of people being beastly to each other, being really horrible. Um, and it's, I think it's just intended to show us that we understand what humanity is like. We understand the, the total mess of sibling relationships. We understand the challenges of all the different things that people are facing, the reality for women. And we're going to write it down in order that you might believe us when we talk about God. So, you know how when you're talking about someone, if you can really define their situation well, they'll listen to you about the next thing you say. And I, the Old Testament, Sam believes, and I think I'm coming to believe it too, is really just trying to write down what, what, does, what is humanity really like? And we're going to hold it, hold space for it. And then we're going to tell you about God and what God's character is like. Um, and then I think the New Testament, actually, is, all the references I can find just seem to be about fidelity. And bearing in mind, everyone got married in their teens. So uh, everyone involved that Paul is writing about or all the references in the, in the New Testament would have been adulterous. There would have been people who... And, and because of this anxiety around um, sort of marriage was really just about p property law and passing on your, um, your uh, property to your legitimate heirs, um, and your sense of your gift to the world being your, your, your descendants, and so you needed to know who your descendants were. Um, the, I think St. Paul and various other people are saying, look, gay sex counts as well. It's also being unfaithful to your long-term partner if you are having sex with someone of the same gender, or if you're, you know, you're a teacher who's sleeping with their student as part of the standard norms. This counts. I, I think whatever you make of those passages, there's only three tiny references in the New Testament. Um, in, usually, two of them are just in lists of other things, and the, it's very difficult to fully understand what the words mean. Um, but it was definitely extramarital. So I think I'm against extramarital affairs. You know, I, I, I think there's a whole other conversation about polyamory, and there's a whole other conversation about open marriages, but in a marriage where there's been a commitment to, to be sexually faithful to each other, that is important. And I think that's what, that's what really is behind it. So I think, um, I think there is something that, that has been used in those passages. But, but what I really see, actually, in terms of how I understand my ethics from the New Testament, from the Bible, is this importance of taking the characteristics of Christ and looking at what are the characteristics of Christ and how do I apply it in my life now um, so I have a I'm in a civil partnership how do I apply that in my civil partnership how do I apply it to the relationships around me and actually that's harder than just sticking to the Ten Commandments or sticking to certain rules that have been pre understood like the the commitment to radical com love and honesty and and kindness and all of these other things are much harder to live by as ethics and and I think that's that's my call is in terms of understanding scripture and what scripture has to say to the LGBTQI community it's the same thing it's saying to every community it's, it's there is this person of Christ who's amazing and how can we live as part of Christ's character and, and body here um, in our circumstance with the internet and with all the things that weren't present there but we have this invitation to imagine and partner with the narrative um, so the idea that the narrative hasn't stopped but we have an opportunity to partner with that in our circumstance and that each person in their each queer queerness of each individual circumstance has an ability to work out what does that mean there now and that's different from every other person on the planet and so each person has something, a letter to write in the story of God that no one else can write. Um, and I think that's the really empowering experience of scripture to me. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, Christina, please tell us what you think. 
I think the work that's been done around translation is important. So mm -hmm. the interpolation, putting in homosexuality in English translations of the scripture, which is now being um, challenged. And Renato Ling's wonderful book, massive book, looking at all these texts and how they are very difficult to translate and, mm -hmm. and people um, mistra love lost in translation. He asked me to proofread that book because um, with other people because English is not his first language. And it, it's, it's so thorough, it just demolishes uh, any of the, uh, of the terror texts that could be thrown at us. I also quite like the idea that um, um, Gen Theodore Jennings uh, proposes that uh, Christians tend to uh, look at the Old Testament in terms of law um, and ignore the narrative. So in terms of trans, I mean, all you've got is was it Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman shall not dress as a man, a man shall not dress as a, as a woman. And he, and, but then he says, but look at the Joseph narrative in Genesis, um, Joseph's um, coat, actually this is um, a robe worn by a virgin daughter of, of, of the king of Israel, so it's a princess dress. So why don't, we look, why don't we focus on that, the narratives, as, as Sally said, this is the story, instead of just focusing on these little bits of law. I'm not very, it, scripture was not my strongest point in, in my studies, um, but when, when we were writing Transfaith, my co-author Chris Dowd said, would you like to write the Bible studies? And I thought, no, not really. But anyway, <laughs> I, I did. And, you know, it struck me um, in terms of, of trans, we're always told to go back to Genesis and to Adam and Eve. And so I thought, well, why not start with Romans and the new Adam? You know, we're Christians. Let's look at, let's look at the new Adam. Or then again, you know, how do you become trans? Does it happen in the womb? Um, is, it, is it, you know, hormones in the womb? What about Psalm 139, which is just wonderful for all of us, any human being, about what it's like to be in the womb and to be loved by God um, from the beginning. Um, there's so much in scripture that we can, we can engage with and that can be life-giving and, and celebrate God's love for, for, for everybody. That's wonderful, thank you. Angela, what do you think? Sure, um, well I guess it was when I was at St. James's that I kind of first came across this kind of holistic approach to scripture, this sense of you read scripture with your head, your heart and your feet. And of course it's, it's really important to to read scripture with your head, to think about the, the kind of what's behind the text, what's in the text itself, and to think about the world which we inhabit in front of the text today, I suppose. But I often think, I mean, I, I don't come from a tradition that values proof texts, but I think that one thing that maybe make, marks out proof texts is, is our emotional response to them. And I think that, I think it's so important for us to try and understand how these passages speak to our heart and to try and to try and understand what God might be saying in, in that regard too and maybe we need some some ways of engaging with scripture um, in in that regard I suppose I find it helpful to think about it as a living word to think about scripture almost as if it was a person and trying to imagine how might I interact or engage with that person and I find um, the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis really helpful. So, so lots of people will know the story. Jacob wrestles with the angel all night um, and then says, I will not let you go until you bless me. It's very difficult sometimes to keep wrestling with texts from the Bible. But I wonder if that's a helpful image for some and a way of allowing scripture to speak to your heart in perhaps unexpected ways. And maybe, maybe wrestling isn't a good image. What does it look like to play with scripture? What does it look like to dance with scripture? What does it look like to, um, getting away from the person for a moment, to pick scripture up and turn it upside down? 
um, and shake it? What does it look like to, to um, prepare a meal with scripture, to be in a conga line with scripture? Maybe this all sounds crazy, but I think there's, there's something in how do we get inside our hearts and how our hearts are responding um, and maybe, maybe changing, changing our language and thinking about how we relate to scripture as a living thing, a living word might help us a bit. Wonderful, thank you. And Simon, what do you think? Um, yeah, thank you. So a bit like Sally, I did grow up in a, an evangelical background where the, the proof text did matter and were used conclusively. So, you know, I've, I've, I've taken deep dives into the proof texting and there's been some interesting stuff that's come out of that and I could kind of have those arguments with people although I'm not proposing to go through it all tonight. But one of the things that really did strike me about that was um, at the beginning of Romans where you know, we hear Paul saying that he doesn't approve of sexual activity that he describes as unnatural. Um, we tend to go from there straight to an interpretation that equates that unnaturalness with um, homosexuality which, of course, as I have had to learn from my friends, uh, what's natural for me ain't natural for someone else, and what's natural for someone else ain't natural for me. And I've come to the conclusion that, really there, the sin is not about being LGBTQ+. The sin is a theology that requires people to act in defiance of their nature. So I would put conversion therapy, for example, as the very sin that Paul is condemning in that passage, or a modern version of the sin that Paul is condemning in that passage. Uh, but I also recognise that I'm unlikely to convince someone by making an argument like that, and this is the problem. Somebody is not going to convince me now that I should change my mind on this, and I'm having a lot of trouble convincing other people that they should change their mind, particularly in the Baptist world, where uh, the affirming Baptist churches are sadly in a minority. Um, and I think we, we need to try and move, um, move the debate slightly away from exegesis, where we argue about what does this text mean, uh, or what did this text mean, and what does it mean for us today. I think we need to move into a discussion and a mature discussion about hermeneutics, uh, you know, the, 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 the underlying principles which we bring to scripture when we read it. Uh, and I often think of the Bible as a series of thought experiments about the nature of God. And it kind of weighs them up. Is God violent or is God not violent? You know, that'd be one of those. You get, both, you get both violent God and not violent God in the Bible and the two are in dialogue with each other. And it's people trying them on for size to see which one fits. And they're arguing different corners to see which version of God will settle. And um, something that the Baptists do have in their history is the covenant from the early London Baptist churches which spoke about the covenant of the church being to walk in ways known and in ways to be made known. There's an, an underlying Baptist conviction that there is more light and truth to break forth from God's word. And I think if we can stop having arguments about what this text means and actually start being tr true to a tradition that says, how can this text speak to us in our evolving, changing contexts as God brings further light to changed worlds and deeper revelations of what it means to be human, then we can start having really interesting conversations about the Bible. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so we've been thinking about fidelity and we've had a really helpful rebuttal to ideas of the, the sort of binary opposition of natural and unnatural and um, socially specific responses to uh, sexuality. Um, are there examples in the Christian tradition of non-heteronormative partnerships? Um, Angela, I wonder if you can start us off. Sure. Um, well, we've, we've been talking a little bit about interpretations of scripture and, and there's definitely, I would say, a tradition of queer hermeneutics. So a tradition of, of interpreting the stories of scripture in a, through, through a lens, I suppose, through a lens of queer theory and through a lens of queer experience, I think, as well. And so in that regard, there's, I would say there's a number of sexual relationships um, which, which have been variously characterized as queer. So, so, so David and Jonathan um, would, be, would be one example and Ruth and Naomi would, would be another. Um, I, think that, I think that depending on how radical your queer interpretation is, 
there are a number of other relationships that you could potentially say had queer elements. Um, you could say, for example, that the creation of Adam and Eve was queer in the sense that, in the sense that it was, it came about as a result of God producing diversity, as a result of God making people who were different, both socially and sexually. And so I suppose even though that relationship is often held up as the paradigmatic heteronormative relationship, that doesn't necessarily follow. It depends, I think, on whether on the lens, the hermeneutic through which you read the story of, of their creation. And so I think that I think that even relationships which are held up um, as as heteronormative in the Bible have the potential to be read through a queer lens. That is so interesting. Thank you, Angela. Um, Christina, what do you think? I discovered um, after we'd lived in our flat for a few years that three doors down um, in the 1890s lived a young man who was in Oscar Wilde's circle. He worked at the, the Bodley Head and Wilde entertained him, took him out to dinner. He was at the first performance of Lady Windermere's Fan. Also, of course, in Wilde's circle was John Gray, um, the poet. Um, Wilde's Dorian Gray is supposed to have been based on John Gray. Uh, John Gray became a, had become a Catholic a little prior to this, but not very seriously. But when the Wild trial happened, he became a more serious Catholic. And he trained as a priest in, at the Scots College. His friend and mentor was Mark Andre Rafalovich, who Wild said had come to London to found a salon and had succeeded in founding a saloon. This was very unkind. Um, and Rafalovich was a, a theorist of homosexuality, and he didn't buy into the current theory, uh, uh, which was that um, gay men had feminine souls and gay women had masculine souls. He just thought it was about who you were attracted to. Gray and Rafalovich were a couple. It's very obvious they were a couple. Um, Gray was the parish priest in Edinburgh, and Rafalovich lived in the parish, went to mass every day, they met every day. Um, Rafalovich paid for all the work to be done to restore the church. Like characters in the Bible, we can't really know what that relationship was like. We can't, we can't use our contemporary um, terms, apply it to them, but um, they were an erotically close couple. And there are many couples like this in the churches today. Gray and Rafalovich could not be open about their relationship, though everybody knew. And what needs to happen is that people need to be more open about their relationships, especially if they're in positions of leadership in the church. We are in the Church of England, we only have one out gay bishop. This is, this is not good. We're not in the 1890s. We can do better. Hmm. We certainly can. Thank you, Christina. Um, Sally, would you like to take on? Um, well, I mean, Anne just mentioned the top ones that everyone pulls out. Um, David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi. Um, I think one of the things I'm thinking of at the moment, though, is, is just that I think in biblical times, and actually, I've just, um, before I was at St. Martin's, I was a university chaplain, and I think modern culture coming through has less of a preoccupation around yes, but sort of our sex, basically, are people sleeping together or, or not when they define relationships? There's this old adage, you might have heard it, of like, 
uh, someone says, oh, yes, you're a homosexual, but are you a practicing homosexual? And then the person says, practicing? <laughs> I'm an accomplished homosexual. <laughs> and, and I think that's very sort of noughties, really. That's very, two, like, 2000s. In, like, I don't think you get young people anxious over other, who the person is sleeping with, who they're not sleeping with, you know. And actually, I think there, was, there wasn't that anxiety in the Bible that, that we clearly see an incredibly close relationship between David and Jonathan. They say it's closer than that of women. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's perhaps even more tangential, but between Ruth and Naomi, there's a, there's a covenant relationship. I don't know, if, I, don't, I suspect they weren't sleeping together, actually, but there's a level of covenant relationship to journey in life together. Um, we had that reading read out in our civil partnership because it, it, we felt it spoke to something that me and my partner wanted to say about our relationship, that we would have that level of covenant to each other. And, I, I mean, I think there is perhaps a more mature conversation around what is a relationship. I, I've only been in a civil partnership for... I get this one right. Three or four years, I can never remember the exact amount. <laughs> but um, but if you talk to couples who've been married for 50, 60 years, and you ask them to talk about their marriage, their sex life is important often, but it's not the only thing. And I think there's something about relationships that I think we need to value those relationships we see in the Bible, and without looking for, oh, this is the naughty bit or whatever, but just valuing the whole thing and. You know, whether they, David and Jonathan were sleeping together, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure it matters. They, they had a deep, committed relationship, which has something to teach all of us in, in whatever relationship or celibacy we're, we're in. Um, and I think there's something to be celebrated um, in that. The only other one I'd mention is um, actually Mary. That was my big saviour when I began to like get my head around the fact that I would... You know, I, I was out on TV, but I hadn't had a relationship before then. It wasn't like it was something that I'd, I wasn't one of those bishops. Um, but, but Mary, as someone who was perceived to be sexually deviant, even though she was trying to be faithful, was really important to me. And I think as a role model, as someone who, who has, a, and that commitment to follow God, even when you're not understood, um, was really important to me coming out from a more conservative culture. And Simon, what about you? Thank you. Yeah, so um, just s sticking with Ruth and Naomi for a moment, I think there's a really interesting insight at the end of their story. Um, so uh, Liz and I have been married for 27 years, and we are child-free, not childless. We chose not to have children. And I think there's a real thing about marriage must be about having children. And of course, not, not every straight marriage has children, uh, and that's fine. Um, but not every same-sex relationship doesn't. Mm -hmm. And one of the really interesting things in the Ruth and Naomi story is when um, Ruth uh, gets pregnant by Boaz and gives birth to the child, she gives the child to Naomi, her mother-in-law, who lays it on her breast, and then all the women of the village go, a child has been born to Naomi, mm -hmm. which is clearly not true. Um, and, you know, you kind of think, is, is this a kind of prototypical sperm donor for a lesbian mm -hmm. couple here? <laughs> so I, I, just, I just kind of want to offer that thought around that. Um, I was preaching recently on um, eunuchs, as you do. Um, I was preaching on the Ethiopian eunuch in the Book of Acts. And he's a complex person. He's man, but not man. He's at the center of society, and he's on the margins. He's wealthy and powerful, but he's excluded and othered. He's devout and seeking God in a religious culture that deems him unacceptable to God. He's on his way up to the temple, but wouldn't be allowed to enter the temple. Uh, you know, he's somebody who's kind of centered and othered simultaneously. And I just think there are so many people in our world who are a bit like him and other eunuchs in the Bible, um, whose bodies tell complicated stories, mm -hmm. and that uh, God still calls and embraces those people. Uh, and I think there's something that we can draw out of Scripture there. And I think the, the final thing I just want to note on this one um, is that I think Israel as a nation is transgendered in Scripture. So, uh, I mean, you know, Israel is the name Jacob, it, it's a masculine name, uh, they are the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, and yet, consistently throughout the prophetic literature, mm. uh, God is the husband to the bride, which is Israel, and there's a whole lot of imagery, and it, it's a lot more than the kind of um, the English or the French idea that, you know, 
boats are female and cars are male or whichever way around it goes. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a male as a bride uh, and the nation of Israel is embodying that. So I think there's something really interesting around the way Israel is personified and spoken of that um, does things around gender norms. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, so as we've seen, we've had there are a lot of queer figures in the Bible. There are lots of queer spaces in Christian traditions. Um, but thinking about us today, um, how do we get Christians to practice um, acceptance rather than tolerance? And how would you distinguish those two terms? Um, so, Angela, can we start with you? Okay. Well, I guess. I guess very often it feels as if on issues around sexuality and gender, there's very often a split or a breakdown in relationship between people in the LGBT community and Christians who have different views or about sex around sexuality and gender, Christians um, who might come from very different, sometimes theological traditions, who might come out of very different social contexts. And I think very often that relationship, um, the relationship between these two groups of people in the church can seem irreparably damaged, fractured. And, and I think my kind of approach to answering this question would be, we need, we need restoration of the relationship between these two parts of the church, maybe, between these two groups of Christians. Um, I guess I'm influenced here by um, Jesuit priest, Father James Martin, who wrote a book called Building a Bridge. Um, he's writing out of a Roman Catholic context, but he's thinking about how, if you imagine um, LGBT Catholics and, and the church as being on opposite sides of a chasm, how can you build a bridge that allows allows the two sides to come together in some way um, that seeks to repair some of that damage. Um, and he uses, he uses a, a kind of formula around respect, compassion, and, and sensitivity, which, which I really like. Um, so he, he talks about things like respect, um, call people what they want to be called, honor the gifts and talents that people bring who are from the LGBT community, treasure them, treasure us as individuals. He talks about compassion in the sense of suffering with. We need to listen to the stories of rejection and hurt. We need to listen without interruption. We need to stand up publicly against discrimination. Sensitivity. We need to accompany LGBT people where they are without judgment. I think it's, it's perhaps especially difficult if we frame it as a debate, if we frame it as we have arguments which, which mean that people must agree with, what, with our theological position. If we, if we have two sides that are trying to battle against each other with theological or scriptural points, it seems very hard for me to, to build that bridge. And I think that there's something pastorally there which is, which is needed perhaps alongside the debates, um, but something which is aimed at repair and restoration of relationship. That's so helpful, thank you. Christina, what do you think? I'm having a real struggle with this one, I have to admit. Um, I, I preached in Simon's church, not you, know, you weren't there, I don't think, and I quoted um, a John Locke um, about tolerance, toleration, because that was very important, that, that document, his essays, because there had been so much religious conflict in, in Britain with the civ Civil War and afterwards. And so it was a an attempt philosophically to, 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 to bring some mediation and a place where people could be together. I was criticised afterwards because somebody was saying, oh, well, we don't want people just to tolerate us. But that's not what it's, uh, it's about, really. It's about, be, it, it, about being able to lay these 
differences aside and move, move forward. It does all feel very polarized. I mean, I go to, a, a, or via Zoom at the moment, once a year to a conservative evangelical theological college to, to talk about equality and diversity around transgender. And the person who invites me and chairs, and he's very new, you know, he's doing the toleration bit because he's incredibly neutral doing this. But I can't stand his views. You know, I like him as a person. We get on together as a person. Then I was in the Living in Love and Faith, and I spent one extraordinary evening where we were having a, a, a meal. It was with the, the College of Bishops, and I was sitting next to a conservative evangelical bishop, and we had this uproarious evening. And, and another bishop said, what was all that about? And I said, oh, well, he was being outrageous. And the other bishop said, well, you two are the most outrageous people I know. You know, the, we can get on with people, we can meet with people, we can talk <coughs> about these things, we can pray together, but actually, if you are trans or gay or lesbian or bi, whatever, and you go into these situations, it's quite toxic. So I feel exhausted when I, you know, when I, when I come out of that session in that conservative theological college, and I think, oh, next year I'll ask somebody else, somebody else to do it. And at times I feel very intolerant. I want to cancel people because of their views, and I want to see conversion therapy banned. So I, I find it quite complex. Thank you. Um, John, what do you think? Um, I, mean, I think the, the besetting sin of Christian communities has always been self-righteousness. Mm. I mean, we, we see it in the apostles, it, it's always there. You know, um, Jesus introduces the Eucharist and then they immediately start kind of arguing over who's better than someone else. So I, I think the, the first thing to say, to, especially to kind of queer identified Anglicans, is that you, you do need to manage your expectations about the, the pace of change within the Church of England. It is an incredibly socially conservative institution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's not a good idea for people to, to pin their spiritual, mental and emotional well-being on the whole of the Church of England becoming LGBTQ plus affirming um, because uh, that, that is unlikely to happen in my lifetime. Um, but that, um, you need to know that you are a beloved child of God. Um, you need to know that however many homophobes there are in the church, you need to know that that is true. You need to believe that in yourself. I can, I can remember when I, um, as a teenager in Essex, as I, as I came to an awareness that I was different from other boys, um, as I came to a consciousness of being gay, that came with a really um, strong sense in my heart that this was okay, that I was loved by God, that other people might have a problem with this, but that was their problem. And when I look back now, I think that is the, that is the first time that God spoke to me. Um, so I think people need to, um, you know, as, as Tina says, those kind, of, those kind of encounters can be exhausting and people need to um, protect themselves and practice good self-care. Um, and then, those of us who feel strong and confident enough can engage in those kind of dialogues that need to happen, which do need to happen. And, you know, personal testimony is really powerful and we need to find ways of spending time with people who think differently from us and maybe not just immediately clashing on that particular issue. I think, you know, Simon was saying earlier, there's a, there's a lot that underpins this that we need to talk about, about the, the way that we interpret scripture. Um, about our, our ideas of, of the body and sexuality and pleasure and what it means to be holy. Um, but yeah, so I think if we, if we do need to tackle that particular issue, but there's also so much more work to be done as well. Mm. That certainly is. Um, Simon, please tell us what you think. Um, um, yeah, ex acceptance rather than tolerance. I think we need to ban phrases like 
um, love the sinner, hate the sin, uh, and any language of being LGBTQ as God's sort of acceptable second best for humanity. Uh, I, I have inhabited both those spaces in my journey to where I am now, and I recognize them as sinful and want to repent of them. And I also think Christians need to listen more and talk less. And in our listening, we should prioritize those whose voices have a history of being excluded from God's people. And we do this because the witness of scripture is that God is usually encountered with the marginalized and the excluded. So if we want to listen to God, we have to listen to those with whom God is most likely to be. And so I think we just need to talk also about sin a lot less. Sin is not the naughty things we do or the things that others do that we think are naughty. Uh, sin is displacing God at the centre of creation and the sinful behaviour is that which emerges from placing ourselves at the centre of our personal universe. And I think we need to have a, a different way of articulating what we mean about sin in relation to human behaviour, which takes it away from labelling certain expressions and behaviours uh, as inherently sinful. And then I just think people have got to stand up and be counted. And those of us who are sitting here tonight are doing that, and I think there's just a real challenge. The weight of opinion within Christianity is not where we're sitting tonight. And uh, I know there are reasons why that is, but I think we just need to be bold and have courage and have faith and believe that God is at work. Thank you. And Sally, last one to you. Um, I mean, I agree with everything that's been shared, actually. Um, there's a great phrase that if, if you're defining mission, to say mission is spotting what God is already doing and joining in. Um, and I think when I, I set up a, lar a large charity supporting LGBT Christians in conservative wings of the church, from Catholic to Pentecostal and Evangelical, and one of the things we really found is that there's often a lot more happening in the straight friends and family who you think are going to be super conservative than you'd expect. There's um, one lovely story of um, the guy who now runs our Diverse Church Parents Network, um, a, a wonderful guy called Bruce Kent, and he was an Assemblies of God Pentecostal minister. And this works within his framework, so if you're not into Pentecostalism, just suspend it and hear it, hear it as a story that meant something to him. He had a prophetic dream where God came to him in a dream to say, your son is gay and I'm fine with that. And that was a 160 de 180 degrees turn from where he was. Um, and he was able next, when his son came back from university, to say, I think you've got something to tell me and I want you to know that I support you and celebrate you. Um, and he got kicked out of the Assemblies of God for that. Uh, and he's just been this incredible source of comfort for a lot of people who've been through a similar journey. And, I mean, that's a very sort of one expression of what that could mean. That's his story, really. But I, I've seen it so many times that, you know, I've had friends from university who I'm sure would, you know, not want to know me if I told them. And then they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, my brother came out 10 years ago and we've been fine with it forever. <laughs> and, and there's actually a lot more that God is doing. We have this phrase in Diverse Church that Aslan is on the move, which is sort of grabbing the Narnia narrative, which is big and evangelical children's world. Um, and I think this idea that you're, this isn't your fight, but we get to play a part by spotting sort of the hints and joining in with those. I think the other thing I learned was that about story. Um, you know, Tina was just talking, talking about story and we had a phrase called storyvism where we just encourage people to find ways to tell your story because that's often the most powerful thing is the stories of ordinary people it's very easy to distance yourself from and I think it is really important you've got you know people in dog collars saying what we're saying tonight and non-dog collars um, but experts from the front but there's nothing quite like someone in your family or someone in your workplace just telling their story and whatever your version of queer is, telling your story and finding a way for you to do that safely, um, even doing it anonymously if you need to, is really powerful. And, and the Bible is a book of stories because God believes in stories and stories make a difference. And, and I think your story can make a difference for people. Um, and then the final one is about celebrating difference. There's a fabulous story from um, C.S. Lewis. They used to meet the, in this little group of writers to 
critique each other's work in Oxford with J.R. Tolkien. And there's three of them that were at the center of it, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and this guy Hugo. And then Hugo died, and Lewis wrote that he was actually, a tiny part of him was glad that Hugo wasn't around anymore because he thought he'd get more of his friend John, uh, J.R. Tolkien. But what he found is he got, lo- got less of John because he didn't get the bits that Hugo brought out, the way that Hugo made him laugh. And, you know, I think the same is true with Jesus, that, that we don't get bits of Jesus if we don't hear it from other people's stories. Um, if we don't hear the experience of God or the world around them, or even for people who wouldn't identify with the Christian faith, their experience of being human um, is lost, and we're poorer for it. And, you know, I think what I probably would want to challenge my conservative friends on is, do you think you've got enough of Christ that you don't need my experience to add to that, to give you an insight into... And I think we, most of us, especially in lots of places in London think we've got enough of, of Christ that we don't need to hear stories of people who are different from us. And I, I guess my challenge now in a very liberal church is who are the stories of Christ that I'm not hearing um, now and how can I hear them? That's so wonderful, thank you. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. That has been such an interesting discussion. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, please join me in a round of applause for our panel.